Here is the democratic democratic So then let's begin with you guys to share about the about your need for competition. Right. Let's welcome Zane. Uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Zane from yeah. Team Data Ninja. That, so Team Data Ninja is basically like one of two teams that represented uh, Singapore <coughs> in this uh, data science team. And the other team we have like uh, YNC Hacks, which they represent. And yeah, uh, I'm really happy to see that such a good turn off. Especially given that the better at the room. Yeah, so... Okay. so Okay, first, uh, I'll just yes. do an intro to the rest of the systems. Do an intro to uh, Data Science Game. So, uh, like what is Data Science Game? It's basically a competition, international competition for data science, organized by uh, a group of volunteers. I think it's actually supported by one of the grand uh, calls of Paris, and one, one of the major uh, universities in Paris. And uh, it's the, this is the second year that they organize this competition. So like anyone who is still uh, studying, you know, if you're interested, you can take part in this uh, next year. I think they're going to do it, uh, uh, one next year. So uh, there's uh, okay. So uh, yeah, and the organizers and sponsors are you know like Microsoft, BXD, yeah. you know. So, okay, there are actually two phases of the competition. The first uh, phase is an uh, online <coughs> image classification challenge organized on uh, Kaggle. And then I think there are like 100 over teams from different universities. So uh, you can, I mean, my university can send like, uh, any number of teams. And then there are a total of 140 over, I think, uh, teams. And then out of the 100 over, uh, there will be uh, the top 20 teams will you know uh, qualify for the final round, which is uh, in uh, which took place in Paris. And out of the 20 teams, like, we have like PhDs and master students, and even like category masters. So like one of the Russian team has like uh, the top number one category in the world, and a few category masters. So like it's like quite imbalanced. Although <laughs> 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 yeah. oh, no, you have one Kaggle master also like crazy over there, our team, and you represent the world. And okay, and, as you can see here, there, there are uh, various, uh, there are numerous countries on the top twenty, like France, uh, Netherlands, Russia, Germany, UK, USA, Japan, India, uh, Singapore, of course, and yeah, India. And. Okay, so the final is actually a code conversion challenge uh, organized by AXA, so the data set is from AXA. And we did like a three, three days hackathon over in a, in a uh, castle in, in Oscar, Paris, which is a really beautiful place. And uh, <coughs> this is the final uh, road. So, okay, the online qualifier phase is an image quali uh, classification challenge. So. Uh, Okay, the business objective, I, I always like to know more about the business objective before I go down into a challenge to understand like, what they're trying to do in terms of the business sense. So like, uh, they are actually looking to optimize solar energy production. So how do they do that? They want to know like, uh, what's the orientation of a specific group from satellite images. So for certain orientations such as uh, flat or even south, north south facing, it's actually uh, more optimal for uh, you know, solar energy. Okay. And the technical objective is basically, you know, given the satellite image and the labels, how, uh, how are you going to train an algorithm to classify correctly the orientation of the groups? And the images are hand labeled uh, by, users, so they crowdsource the images and hand labeled by volunteers. And they only uh, classify the only give the label if there's more than three uh, people who agree on the label. Okay, and you will see later why. And yeah. So okay, the first class is actually uh, north south, which is the optimal one. And second is east west orientation. Third is a flat roof, and then fourth is just others like whatever that don't classify other than the other three. And if you go to the website, it's actually pretty fun like, to, to play with it. Like, 
Yeah, so they actually have this website where you can like, just, you know, label them manually like this. It's probably a flat one. And then this is a flat. And then like, if you don't know, you can just like this and others. Right. So it's, it's, it's really fun. So you can do this if you want. So, yeah, I think that's sort of slides. Okay. Yeah, so, okay, so as an that uh, as shaded with data, there's always like, you know, the D and uh, noisy data. So we have like something like this. So, like, what is this? Like, we really don't know. So, this is actually from the test data set, where it's one of the images that always go wrong. So, like, we, we really like, we have to search for it manually and see what, is it, what it is. And this is like, okay, it's not really clear here, but this, is, this can either be like a flat or an off soft orientation. So it's very ambiguous. And we have this, which is like, I have no idea what, what kind of room is this. And yeah, this is also ambiguous, like it can be like north, south, and east, west. It's, like it's a combination, so it might be others. Yeah. And okay, the accuracy, uh, the, the evaluation metric is basically just uh, classification accuracy. So, uh, and we have like uh, 8,000 images that are hand labeled, that are hand labeled, and 14,000 uh, test set. So, okay, for uh, for those who are now familiar with like uh, Kaggle or those uh, competition, data science competition, <coughs> really, uh, we are given these two set, and then we will need to train like a model to predict the test set. So for the test set, we don't have the labels, we don't know what's the orientation. And from the test set, it's actually split at forty percent to public leaderboard and sixty percent private. So we will only know the public leaderboard during the competition, and the private leaderboard result is only released at the deadline of the competition. And yeah, uh, these are the proportions of the label on the training data set. It's like predominantly uh, one, and then you know two and four and three. Okay. So for the data preparation, it's just like basic stuff that we did. So we did like uh, data augmentation. We created uh, more images based on the eight thousand training images by uh, rotating like randomly up to 70 degrees and uh, horizontal and vertical shift of 10% of maximum 10% of the width and height and shear up to 0 0.2 radian which is like about 11 degrees and you know, so it's like 11 degrees so shear is like you have image so like basically something like this you shear the image and then zoom out to 20% uh, horizontal flip so you take it over horizontally and standard scaling, so that we standardize uh, by dividing mean and uh, minus mean and divide by the standard deviation. And we did this like five to ten times more. So for certain models, we augmented uh, five more, five times more images. And sometimes we do like ten times. But actually, at the end, we only stop at five. And something that we learned after the qualifier from other top teams that we didn't do, unfortunately, is that some of them actually rotate 90 degrees for the level <laughs> one and two. So you, you just change, switch the label, which is something very smart, but we didn't think of. And they also like, uh, yeah, you can also like rotate three and four because the orientation doesn't matter, like for the flat and others. So you can get like, up to ninety percent. Sorry, you can get up to like ninety percent more training data just doing this. And then you further augment it, it will be much more. So these are some tricks that we learned. And okay, so that's what we. And in one response, it's simulated in Kaggle, like the first thing we try is like SGBO because it's like a master algorithm in Kaggle. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. so, so how do we do that? First, we uh, convert the image into a like, matrix. Uh, so each row is like 64 times 64 uh, the pixels of the image. And we just use a grayscale this for you. And then we just create the model, uh, the SGBO model. <laughs> the accuracy is like 56% or little more, which is like not very bad. Like it's still better than random, I guess. But it's like you can't compare with a uh, decent, you know, deep learning model. So uh, next, I'll pass to David to talk about more on uh, the models approach. Thank you, Dave. I'm David. Uh, first, I need to say uh, okay, that uh, none of us are computer vision expert, and so. Uh, we, after trying to we went on to 
deep neural net, which is a, a convolutional net. So because none of our words have any experience, so we just went on to the internet to search. So we did call with uh, five different convolutional net models using five different deep learning frameworks. So we have the learn net, the gain net, uh, PN exceptions, PGG16, and the less net. So I have to pair uh, a control for each of the models. So um, the net is uh, invented by Yael Kun, who is currently the Facebook AI research director. And he's one of the very first top uh, net that uh, helped propel the field of deep learning. So basically, uh, currently most of the convolutional nets are still based on this uh, rough idea, which is the connect can be uh, divided into four main steps. The first one with convolutions, which you have uh, convolution filters of different sets, like 3 by 3, 3 by 3, 16 by 3, 16. Then you move it across the whole image, <coughs> then you get a feature back from each of the filter, then you introduce more linearity using a same one, or uh, in this case it's a uh, rectified linear unit. And the next step will be a pooling, which you can do average pooling or max pooling. And in, in the end you have a, a fully connected uh, layers, which is happen to be the multi-layer perceptions. Okay, we tried the learn net, but the accuracy is quite bad. Yeah, which is slightly better than actually goes. <laughs> then we try the next one, which is uh, happened to be a winner of uh, ILS VRC twenty twelve, which is a com computer vision competition based on the ImageNet data set. Um, it is a significant breakthrough with respect to the previous approach. And basically it consists of eight layers, which five of them with uh, convolutional layers and three fully connected layers with dropouts to prevent the opportunity. Uh, later I will show the individual score them on the test data sets. So you compare the performance of each of the model. Then you have the VN inception model, which is done by a group of uh, Google researchers. So um, Basically what they did is they normalized the layer inputs for each of the training unit batch. This allowed a higher learning rate, so it required less training steps, so you can converge faster. And it dramatically reduced the number of parameters you need to tune. So basically from 4 million, uh, from 60 million, which is LXNet, to 4 million. Um, then you have VGG, which is the first runner up of the same competition in 2014, but based on the same data sets from 2012. Um, the contribution they introduced is a very small convolutional filters, basically it's a 3x3 three three filters in all layers, and they show that the, when you increase the depth of the neural nets, it contribute to a better performance. But they can do that because they use a very small uh, filters. And they have in this particular uh, they use so they increase the number of layer to sixteen in this case. And finally, you have the um, most of these, not the most recent, the recent winner of uh, the same competition at the Coco twenty fifteen, which is still the current state of the art uh, CovNet model, which is a ResNet from uh, Microsoft Research Team. So basically it solved the optimization issue with the deeper network. So they push the limit of the depth further compared to VGG. Uh, how they do that is basically they adding uh, shortcuts connections uh, by skipping one or more layers of uh, cough, cough layers and sum up with the output of the stacks layers. So uh, basically you found and Thanks to Zane, we found this um, ResNet model which boosts our performance a lot and they have a pre-trained model ready for download from the internet ranging from like 18 to 200 layers and uh, Zane quickly learned basic enough to go out, <laughs> able to modify the script to train it. 
and it happened to be our best um, individual uh, deep learning model. So these are the score on the test sets for each of the individual's model. And we actually didn't expect the from scratch, it means we trained the model uh, from scratch we, without any using any pre-trained models. But we only realized that at the like, last few days, so we didn't manage to have time to train the deeper levels on the um, the proof data. Yeah, and fortunately we have Fuimi who is a master of ensemble that help us to boost our score further that led us into the nine spots on the leaderboard. Yeah, now I'll pass it to Fuimi. Okay, thank you David. So at this stage of the competition, right, all of us are very tired and exhausted and our machines are tired and exhausted from the small yeah. So what is the next stage? Next strategy we should take from here is in right? So we have all the individual models here, and even the top one can achieve the top 20 positions, but we want to get higher to make sure that we can secure the top 20 positions. So the, naturally, the next step we should think about is in Zambia, right? How we can use the performances, or the powers of all the models, instead of just give the uh, prediction, by using the prediction of one single model, so that is a strategy we, we actually um, try very hard to find out for the next stage. And uh, as usual, for the multicast classification problem, the first thing we think about is to use the average of the prediction probabilities for each class. Right? I think that's the natural strategy we all think about for multicast uh, problems. But unfortunately, this one was a, a hard Prediction, which means you have to give either one, two, three, or four instead of give uh, probability. So they're not using log loss. So, so the strategy is this. Where sh the strategy we try is called majority vote. Let's think about in the country we have we have a president, right? And all others, Congress or whatever, yeah, who are actually making decisions at the same time. But let's say our best model resonates the president and he makes the decision one, two, three, four for each of the classes. And um, instead of letting him just to take the power and make a prediction for all of them, what we did was that we used all other models, let's say 10 of them, and each of them will give a vote for each of the samples. And we're just okay saying if the majority of all other models agree on one vote, and that vote will be the final vote. Whatever, the, no matter what the president votes. So that is a single strategy. And it turns out it works quite well. So because for all the predictions, naturally we will go for the president's vote, which is the best resonant vote. But if, like say, seven out of the 10 agrees on a different vote, we will overturn the president's decision and use that as a final predictions. So this is a single strategy we use. And Okay, because the majority means that all other models accept the best ResNet, because we also have other ResNet models, like uh, the one you saw just now, like um, other models have a lower prediction, but it's also ResNet architecture. So, at the end of the prediction, the method helps us to boost this ranking from the 20 to the 9. So by simply using the majority vote in sampling on all of the predictions that we have made already. So this is the hope, the final hope that we see that works quite out, well, works out quite well. Because at this moment of stage, we do not make any more predictions from new architecture or existing architectures. So this is a simple final strategy we take. And yeah, so we boost our ranking to a nice so what didn't work out, like I said, assembling of the probabilities does not really help out because this is not a lot plus um, evaluation metric. It could work quite well for other uh, competitions where you are using like log loss for the probabilities. And um, what we have, uh, what we should have tried, but we didn't have time to try it, that we can use actually boost to extract the abstract features. All of the pixel features then fix, uh, sorry, the pre-trained models to extract features from the pixel levels. Then you use, use those abstract uh, features to fit attributes, for example. 
this school uh, work as well about the AI. So yes. So I think um, that's all for the final stage for this competition. And now I will pass to Java to talk about the second round of our uh, competition, which is in Paris. Thanks, Demi. That was an excellent explanation of what incentives. Hi, guys. I am Mohammed Jawad, and this was our entire part towards the finals competition. So now let's move on to what we had to face in the finals. So the finals of the finals of data science game was held in Paris, as I mentioned before, and it was a hackathon style event where we had to struggle out for about four and a half days to come up with a model, the predictive model, and it was sponsored by AXA. So, uh, so this is how I'll be going forward from now. I'll just give a brief introduction about the competition itself, and then, and then I'll speak about the methodology. Uh, I'll give a brief intro about the data set and speak about the methodology or the build process that we that we went through for one and a half days to come come for the competition. The challenge was to build an insurance code conversion model. And the data set was provided by AXA, who was a sponsor for the competition. And the insurance code conversion model was for the specific data set contained information about the car insurance. And so if a user if a user is going to purchase an insurance code, he would enter all his information that is available to him and then he would submit these details and get a code directly from either AXA's website from any one of the subsidiaries, like brokers or agents. So the code that the user gets can be the same or different, and it can be the same user who has requested for code from multiple, sub uh, multiple subsidiaries or brokers. And so that was the model of the competition. And you have to come up with a solution to predict if the user will be converting his code and purchasing it, or and you also have to predict um, among the given channels which is a subscriber or which is a broker through which you will be purchasing the code. So, among the number of codes, the user can either purchase from one broker or he may not purchase the insurance at all. And so, uh, the data set that we received was something like this. Uh, each code that, the, that was shown to the user was provided to us. And so the quote information contained user details, his personal information, obviously must personal information, and the policy information, the car details, and things like that. So this is from the website where the AXA collects users' information, which is publicly available. And the data set was highly imbalanced. Less than one percentage of the users who got the quotes converted them into the insurance. So it was a highly imbalanced test problem. And the evaluation metric that was given to us was log loss probability calculation. So let's move on and see what was the build process that we had to solve this problem. So this is what we had basically in mind. The first thing we wanted to do was to uh, get to know the data well, discover insights from the data, convert these insights into features that can be used by the model, and to perfect the model that we are choosing. So, we spent about, uh, the competition began about uh, early in the morning on Saturday, and we spent about two to three hours going through the entire data set, trying to figure out what makes sense, can we track something out of this, can we find some features that we could really, really boost the model that we will be building. So, that was the time spent in feature engineering, and some of the insights that we got was quite interesting. So, based on the cars age, you can, you can say, uh, so usually in European countries, I think uh, the purchase or the validity of the insurance was for one year. And so if the car's date is approaching one year or more than, just slightly more than 365 days, there's a much higher chance that the user is going to purchase the insurance irrespective of the code price. So that was one such uh, indicator that we just uh, found from the data inside. And so, we wanted to convert all these insights into features that the model can take advantage of and improve our accuracy. Uh, we categorized certain numerical features like what we discussed as before, and then we derived various policy-based features, user-based features, 
uh, use of its behavioral statistics and all that. And there were a lot of categorical variables, uh, one hot encoding, one more hot encoding helped them. And this was the models that we tried after feature engineering. So we first, uh, since this is a log loss evaluation metric, we had high confidence in our JDX Zegos algorithm, which was a default for candlelight -like computations. And we went ahead and tried XGBoost and it was showing promising results, but we still wanted to try out other algorithms and see if our accuracy would improve much higher. So we came up with random models, XGB, Keras, and then and logistic regression and did an ensemble of all these models, but it was still worse than the first XGB model that we built. So we decided not to spend too much time on doing ensemble and go back to what we do well and focus on XGB feature engineering and tune our model well so that it could handle or improve the accuracy. So we also utilized XGB's uh, feature importance, uh, which, uh, which gives you the list of important features and we tried, we reiterated the feature engineering. Uh, for the model tuning, uh, we used five-fold stratified cross-validation. Since this is an imbalanced data set, we had to use stratified cross-validation. And finally, what we did was uh, we had about one, one and a half hours at the end of the competition. So we wanted to try an ensemble of XGBoost. We created two XGBoost. And again, it was a very nice idea to try this out. We had so much confidence in the ensemble approach. So uh, we created two XGB models with different initialization parameters and then got the probability and average to the average probability, slightly boosted our score, I guess. So that was it. And our final results were announced and we were ranked six in the leaderboard. That's it. So which machines did, you, what hardware did you use to train the, the deep learning models uh, for the previous, yeah? Um, we used both uh, AWS and, in fact, myself, I got a desktop machine before. Yeah, yeah it's supercomputer. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, this one has a question in terms of the neural net architecture for the first one and second one. I guess the first one is a layer they chain from the scratch, and the second one is like fine tuning, right? On the picture model, we should train on the image net. Um, yeah. Yes. Which yes. has around. So, how long does it take for <laughs> training from scratch, and how long does it take for the second architecture training, fine tuning? Okay. That one? For the training of scratch, we are training on the 18 layers. Yeah. So, we, so I think. Close to two days running on the NVIDIA GTX 1080 graphic card. 1080. 1080. Oh, And the pre-trained model, I think, should take less than half a day. All right, right. Around like, maybe eight, six to eight hours. A bit, a bit depends on the learning rate you set. All right. But usually for pre-trained model, for the fine tuning, right, you need to uh, usually set a lower learning rate. Yeah, yeah. So you don't need to change the weight too much. Yeah. Sorry, it's like the, about the winner's round of challenge. I mean, other than rotating the images, what did they do differently that allowed them to win as compared to you guys? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which one for the first one? What? The other winners. Oh. I think uh, I mentioned just now that like, they uh, rotate the image to create more training, uh, training data set. So in case you miss it, so actually like yeah. So they actually rotate uh, 90 degrees the images uh, for label one and two. So and then switch the label so you can have more 100 percent more training data. And then I, I think one of the teams, one of the top teams also, they use pre-trained models like what we did, and they extract features from the video models, uh, and then they use it to train on, uh, they, they train it on random forest or, or, or another SGBoost. So it's a stacking. 
so they use pre-trained to uh, pre-train on this uh, on these images, and then they extract the features. Uh, is like probably this uh, is just a like numbers, and then they train another uh, stacking model on top of it. So it's like stacking, basically called stacking. Yeah. And one of the things they have access to like, GPU clusters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because they're like mostly university researchers and then PhDs. Yeah. What about the exodus? What, what, what did the real winners of the exodus? Oh, the real winners. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're just too imbalanced because they have to be real monsters. <laughs> actually, um, actually, I have to mention one thing. Like, if you look at the actual data, right, you will see that for those data which the model makes the wrong predictions on, and even your like human like us cannot make the cannot guess the correct one. So how can we the model learn to, to predict the correct one? Because the model are trying to learn to get close to the humans, right? Because we're learning from the ground truth. Ground truth is labeled by humans. The, there are actually quite a lot of errors inside the data sets. And also those errors, those images that humans couldn't label correctly. So what I mean is that probably there's just bad luck. <laughs> I'm not saying it a lot, but that's the truth. Because if you look at the data, with our single best models, for those that are not pretty correctly, they're all like not possible to tell the correct truth. So what I'm saying is about 80% is all good models. But there's no real difference. I mean their point, like one percent, two percent is nothing at all. I mean it's not a difference in in reality. Any other questions? But on, on, on the on the single challenge that you did Paris. What, what, what did the others do that to make that model better? Sorry, what, what, what was the method did they use or what was the other selections did they use in order to get better results? Uh, so the first, the team that came first uh, tried just XGBoost without using any models. So the difference should have arise basically on the feature engineering part where they could have figured more features and I think that is a or tuning tuning better hyperparameters. That is why the difference player. No. Actually one of the features they use I actually we forgot to use is that to use topic modeling or LDA on those categorical features is quite a common strategy that we can use, but we forgot to use that too. Just like you have one zero one zero like categorical one how encoding and you just try to like get topic modeling so some sort of stuff to actually reduce dimensions to 10 or 5 and use those as additional features which we forgot to do. <laughs> uh, during the final uh, competition, around how many features are you using? And during the feature engineering part, do you find uh, some really useful feature engineering skills? Yeah, okay, so the really useful feature is the uh, the frequency or number of calls this user has done. So that is called the behavioral features. This is actually very useful for real world, uh, real world like uh, problems, like for, for example email campaigns or other things. So the user behavior is always the most important features in order to make predictions from the response of the users. So the more calls the users got, probably just a spam or just trying to see. Uh, compare between different companies, right? So that is actually one of the most we call golden features of company that like uh, increase the uh, accuracy by a uh, huge amount so that would differentiate like uh, five teams or so that is one of the features you must get otherwise you like another feature is like um, similar feature, user behavior features. Right? And other features like product based features like what kind of product feature you can get from this product specifically from the original data sets, on top of the original data sets. And yeah, the rest. And do you use some uh, special feature engineering techniques which can improve the feature engineering part? Like I said, topic modeling on categoricals, uh, which the uh, better winning model uh, teams tried, and uh, like who by count, who by max, or basic statistics. <coughs> Cannot reveal too much the secret, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, I said, <laughs> basic, I mean, group by some you know, basic statistics, group by statistics. Okay. Thanks. So when you apply a simple uh, strategy, 
how about how you deal with those cases? The two options end with the same probability because you have A algorithm, right? And uh, again, why not using weighted or voting instead of. Oh, you mean the ensembling yeah. part? Okay, uh, so you're saying why not just treat them like without any precedent or Congress, just like everyone is equal, then just use a weight to attach to each of the votes? Yeah, this is one. And second one, how about like, the two. Uh, Two options uh, end up with the same problem. Because uh, first of all, we do not have much time to try different strategies in the last minute. But mm -hmm. the basic idea is very simple. We just want to imp improve from the best single model we have got, right? We don't want to get worse results. Because if you try different ways, it can turn out to be worse. So the, based on this idea, we define. We think about the majority vote, which is the majority votes a different prediction compared with the best single model where we use a majority vote instead of the best single model otherwise it's the best case because everyone agrees on the same thing right? but the majority can be two candidates right yeah the majority is like like let's say we have 10 other mo uh, models the, the uh, majority should be more than five or 50 percent of them and we try the threshold like six seven eight nine and turn out to be one of them which is seven i think that will give the best accuracy based on the lower scores. So you just try and error because you don't know where your threshold. If you have more, like eight or nine, you'll get less overturns, like less a difference. The difference is meaningless, it's like zero times zero one percent. Of course, they'll have much higher true positive, but the thing is, you cannot make a big difference. So that's why you have lower threshold. But if you lower too much, it will overturn like wrong, wrongly. Like, False positive, so that's why you have to find the best threshold. Hey guys, we need all for all our team coming up, so we just save some of our questions for YNC next. Let's thank the Taylor Ninja. No, they were a date, right? Yeah, okay. Okay. Teammates, mentors, and students get benefit from each other's skills. 
which makes the listening game a unique learning experience. The data science game challenge really is a forum where students and outside private sector can exchange. It's a very interesting challenge because uh, uh, like uh, first of all, it's very simple, but it's not because it involves a lot of specific knowledge and we need to understand that how insurance works and also the class environment in the data that makes it you know, even harder. We don't know that what will be the test set, so we need to be prepared for that and make a generous model out of it. To do work the challenge, we need to incorporate ideas from us with knowledge of insurance. The data scientists in terms of skills, it's more than the technical side or the technical thinking of it. It's about linking it with the business. So really understanding what they do and why they do it. And on the other side, making that what they discover is used up, transform this insight into value. The international spirit of the data science game brings to Paris a great variety of power. It's an international opportunity to uh, work explore and compete with uh, teams from all over the world. I talked to many of them like from all the best schools around the world and I really learned a lot from uh, like each of them to find the impact on the mission. Yeah, so it was a pretty slow time, uh, two days. Uh, being locked up in a castle was never, never imagined to be this fun. Um, yeah, and so I guess we will present on sort of like our insights and our experiences for the two challenges. Um, I guess first we can introduce ourselves. Um, so I'll start, um, I'm Sean. Um, I'm a undergraduate, fourth year uh, undergraduate student at Yale NUS. I study computer science. Um, and yeah, uh, I'm doing research in uh, AI uh, or deep learning. Uh, specifically. Hello guys, I'm Amrula. Um, I'm actually taking a leave of absence from Yale NUS um, and I'm running a organization that does um, quite a lot of competition. So. My name is Rohan Naidu. I'm a senior at Yale NUS, which is a fourth year student, uh, like Sean. I study physics and astronomy and astrophysics, so I'm like dabbling with computer vision and all this fun stuff. Um, yeah, the, the interesting thing is that this is our first uh, Kaggle or data science competition ever for any of us. And so we had a lot of, like, we learned a lot, um, especially when we went to Paris, we had a lot of amazing experienced professionals and PhD students, master's students, and we learned a lot. So uh, we want to share a lot of things that we learned. And hopefully, you know, uh, um, if any of you are interested in participating next year or doing Kaggle competitions next year, hopefully it will help you with some. Uh, we'll start with the uh, the preliminary challenge. So a lot of heavy lifting has been done again. Uh, so we'll be pretty quick uh, pre-processing. I mean, we did a lot of things that the data ninja did, but in, um, some of the main ones were copying to uniform size, uh, also rotation. One of the first things we did was augment the number, the the, the data set size by turning like the east-west roofs into north-south roofs. Those kind of uh, yeah, it's clear that it was a good thing to do. Um, other techniques, uh, well, for uh, penalization, we do L2 regularization that seems to increase our uh, accuracy a little bit. Um, yeah, and I think, and we'll, now we're talking about our models and uh, other uh, results. Cool. I think I think before I even get into the deep learning models, um, I think you have to really understand that we were very scrappy. We hardly have any hardware. Rohan was running stuff on his Samsung laptop, which was really old. I'm running stuff on my lap, on my Surface, and I'm just carrying it around during meetings, just running stuff. Um, Sean also was running some stuff, and we had another teammate, Jin Ong, which was in, which isn't here, which I had to team viewer into her laptop to run stuff there. 
So it's we're really scrappy. Even spending like ten dollars on AWS is like no. <laughs> so 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 funny story is that the reason why we chose these models was because of those few reasons. We were limited by hardware, in fact. Um, even before we started running these models, we were doing simple open CV stuff. You know, with computer vision, with uh, the roofs, we were running like the half lines just to find out the edges, see whether that determines something. And then we realized mm, maybe deep learning is the way to go. So we ran our first LXNet model, which didn't perform too well. I think it was around 50, 50 ish percent. Um, and then we decided okay, our hardware can take more stuff. Let's run, uh, say, in Central V3. So we were doing a bit of transfer learning here. Um, I think some of you guys might know there are a lot of ways to do this. But with exception V3, we started getting around 70 plus percent. Um, wait, wait, no, 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 no. Actually, it wasn't the case. Our first submission was around 40 percent. And then we realized, and we were like, shit, um, something's wrong. And then I told Rohan, Rohan, I think the labels are just other way around. So whatever this. Label two is actually three, whatever that's label one is actually zero. So we just swapped the models and then we got 70 plus percent. And they were like, okay, we are on the right track. So we looked at one another, we were like, okay, we're not going to be able to run the rest next stuff because like, none of our computers can handle a deep rest next. So we're, we kept running TensorFlow um, inception um, on multiple computers and we were just on something trying to get every 1% up. We were doing that for three days, I think, solid three days. Um, just to be clear, we started working on the this thing only in the last five days before the actual submission. So no hardware, we were rushing, and then I think I, I think we decided, okay, um, let's just do a ResNet thing. I'm gonna run it on my iMac. <laughs> Finally, something big enough. So I ran it on my iMac, and then I realized, okay, by the end of the entire competition, we can only submit one model. And I was like, no, we, we can't do this. It's too high risk. So I told Sean, hey, Sean, I put up our stuff on GitHub. Just download it and then run. I told Rohan to run the same thing. So everyone was trying to run consecutively. I told you, wait, before I actually do that, do you guys know that we never met while we were doing this? Everything was over Facebook. Like, we were remotely coordinating all this stuff. So I told Jean, OK, let's run some stuff. Um, and then she kindly just left her laptop there. I took you in. I just ran the stuff. So this goes to the next point, which is the implementation. So what are the stuff that we run? We use um, Plazania for that. We use TensorFlow. We use Theano. Um, but I think what saved, maybe a, a small part of it was using Docker. I don't know whether you guys have experience like running all these different frameworks, but. Every time you have to reinstall a new framework, every time you have to create a new environment, it's so painful. So I decided to, okay, you know what, let's, use this, uh, let's do this everything over Docker. So that when Sean runs this, he can just push, pull the container and then just run it. And then everyone can do it at the same time. So this sort of saved our life quite a bit. And because of all this stuff, um, we were inching towards 80% mark, just like those guys. Um, and then 81 percent, and that was when we started doing things like ensembling. So to uh, to share with you guys that experience and all that, maybe I'll let Rohan to do. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we were stuck with these models that were 70-ish, 80-ish, and we were completely clueless about what to do. Um, and then, of course, because none of us had actually, other than Sean perhaps, um, actually studied machine learning or data science or any of this. Uh, but I thought up of ensembling on my own, that was such a great, like, oh my god, I'm like, whoa, 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 what a genius, right? Take all these models together and get them to like have some sort of an internal voting system, because each of them is probably learning something else, right? So when you cover, when you put all of them together, uh, well, you have something that has learned more than each of them individually. Um, so for our first initial ensembling, we didn't even know the word ensembling, in fact. After we, <laughs> after, we, after the competition was done and we looked at the forums, we were like, oh wow, so this thing is called ensembling. Like, excellent. Um, so later on we learned that the first thing that we actually tried is something called majority class ensembling, which is basically, um, it's a fancy way of saying that you like ask your models to vote for which one is the best one, and you just trust that one, and you, you just go with that vote. Um, that was the first thing we tried, and with that approach, we were able to gain about a percentage 
uh, over our best model, which is which is significant given that um, in the competition everyone was basically clustered around the 82, 83 percentage mark. So going from 80 to like 81 was uh, was was pretty cool. Uh, but then I decided to like go like go a little more crazy with this, right? I was like, oh great, the working mechanism is working. So let us like think of some uh, even more granular voting mechanism. So I started thinking of this in terms of classes. So I realized that some models were better at predicting roofs that were flat versus some models that were really good at picking out the north-south roofs. So what I did was for each of these models, I went and looked at the validation score per class, and then I weighted the votes based on the, based on the validation accuracy that I knew. So I know that this model, when it is saying that the roof is not south, it probably is really correct because it always guesses not south, right? But then there's this one model that like always looks at east-west and is like, oh, it's a flat roof. Well, it's a flat roof, so we should not trust that one. So I weighted the votes by the internal cross-validation score for each class, and that was the ensemble model that we finally submitted with like barely a few minutes to go. Um, can, I, can I say something? So you have to understand also at this point you were like one, two hours away and then Rohan was doing all this unsomething stuff and then he just told me, dude, I'm going for a dinner date. <laughs> and I'm like, Rohan, are you sure? Yeah, I'm just going to just do one last unsomething. And that sort of got us to 17th place, so yeah. Yeah, great. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so speaking of priorities, going to... <laughs> Going to the date like 10 minutes later versus getting on the data science game finals. Well, well, that's pretty sweet. It was a great evening. Um, well, what are you moving to? Yeah, what we could have done better in this whole process? <laughs> no, I should have like, gotten better computers uh, started earlier, maybe like, yeah, more than like five days before. Because one thing we realized was that um, we had to kill a lot of models while they were still getting better. So you, can, so you keep track of the AUC score after every epoch in training, right? Um, and we saw that some of our models were getting better and better, but we didn't have time to leave them for another like a few hours or half an hour or whatever it was. Um, so I'm sure if you let them, let them go deeper, uh, train more um, epochs, we would have definitely gotten a better score. So just basically deeper models, um, which goes back to our very compromised hardware situation, right? It's um, quite related. Um, yeah, and the more models you had, the more ensemble you could have done. One very interesting thing we realized was um, one of our TensorFlow models was really bad in terms of accuracy. It was only like 69 or 70 percent. Uh, but because of my strategy of of doing this class-wise uh, validation, we realized that it was actually very good at predicting one particular kind of roof, right? Um, and because of my strategy, the weight for that model when it came to predicting that kind of roof, that kind of roof was, was pretty high. So we figured that um, the more models we had, like had our ensemble pool being larger, we could have done this whole uh, wording thing better, which is basically saying that don't throw away even the models that like, seem less accurate, because there might be some like, there might be still some learning in that. So it's worth it to like throw it in and see if it's adding or not. Um, yeah, more pre-processing choices. For example, um, the previous team said that they did all these super cool like sharing, rotating, and actually augmented the data set quite a lot. Um, again, we had like we had no clue. The only augmentation we did was the first thing we realized when we saw the data set was, oh, the north south roof when you flip it, it becomes an east west roof. So just using that logic, we augmented, but we didn't do any of these like simple computer vision. Uh, shears, rotations, simple like zoom in, zoom out. We didn't do any of that. Of course, we could have, but then my RAM would have crashed. Um, <laughs> anyway, secure and better resources. What are we moving to next? Yeah, just, yeah, um, securing better resources. So the thing is, Yale US is a very uh, young college. Uh, we, we just started three years ago. So, like, we realized that a lot of our friends, they have, you know, their universities would have large CPU clusters. And so this is something that over the past few months we've uh, told the school we have to get CPU clusters. So finally, recently we got the school finally got GPUs, okay? uh, and uh, also uh, we uh, subscribed we got a Red Red uh, Red Hat uh, stack, and so now we have CPU clusters running as well. So um, yeah, so paving the way for you know, future Yale NES uh, calculators to actually run 
uh, deep learning models. Uh, yeah, so um, about the final challenge. Actually, the um, thing about the final challenge, we thought we couldn't talk about anything about final challenge because we had to sign something with uh, Exa. Um, so we're a bit worried on this, but um, we want to talk a bit about sort of like our key insights from the final challenge. I, I think there's what's interesting is comparing the final challenge with the preliminary challenge. So as David Ninja explained, it's about insurance policy and uh, predicting the, uh, the conversion of the, uh, the probability of conversion of a given customer. And you, you know, you had all these constraints like a very skewed data set and other things would be like, um, and another difference between image classification and, and a challenge like this is that an image, your data point is just a pixel, it's uniform. Um, as opposed to when you have just a spreadsheet of different types of values, you have discrete values, you have continuous variables, it's just a mess. Uh, and so the, actually what you have to do, and so deep learning is actually not the best strategy uh, in this kind of situation because, um, yeah, in, in deep learning it's better that your data points are uniform, like for an image or like text classification. Yeah, so um, because the data, the nature of the data is different, it's really important to understand the data. And so uh, what does that mean? Uh, so as, for example, it, uh, feature engineering, uh, Data Ninja, they came up with, they realized that uh, the conversion rate is really high when it's the anniversary of the cars, of, of the car. And that's, that's a great point. Um, another thing that we realized is that um, sometimes you find the same customer um, looking at a quote for different cars, like three or four cars. And uh, we realized that um, for, for a customer that has multiple cars, the conversion rate is really, really low. And so we, and so we kind of try to put our shoes into the customer, um, like as if, you know, going through the form. Uh, it's really important, be, as uh, Wei Min said, uh, these labels are chosen by humans. So the machine has to kind of like uh, follow what it, learn what a human thinks when looking for quotes. And so we realize that, okay, so it's probably unlikely that a person has three or four cars. So in what kind of situation would a person look for quotes for four different cars? And we realize that that person is actually shopping for the car itself. So which car would you give me a better insurance quote? So that gives you the insight that that person is actually not looking to get like buy insurance, but trying to see, oh, what is a good car I should buy based on the insurance? And so that kind of fits with the data as well. If the, 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 the person is shopping for cars, then obviously he wouldn't convert. Uh, convert. So, that, uh, so that's something that we implemented and engineered it as a feature. So that's really important for these kind of data sets is that you really have to look at the data points. If you know Tableau or you know, even a simple R scatter plot could do, it could give you a lot more insight rather than just you know, blindly putting it into a black box like a neural network. Um, so that's one of the key insights we, that we got. And um, yeah, ensembling. Uh, as Roman said, we didn't know what ensembling, what, we didn't know that ensembling was called ensembling until we read the form. It's like, oh cool, well, let's do ensembling at the final challenge too. So we use XGBoost, we had an ensembling of several XGBoost models. Again, we were limited by resources. We only had our laptops, like literally our laptops. And, the Azure platforms that they provided was not even close enough to provide, like, to train the models. So uh, we only had like three or four uh, XGBoost models. Uh, what I wanted to do was I wanted to have like whole, like a brand new force or added boost like ensemble, like where you have you take 200 XGBoost models and then you ensemble and you have multiple layers of that. That was like my ideal, but obviously we didn't get that far because hardware limitations. I think that's it. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, like, of course, when we narrate what happened, it's so streamlined, right? Oh, we met in, and we did XG boost, and we did these features, and, and, and that, that's completely false. It's like, after a panic, you're like, okay, great, there's this, like, CSV file with, like, a few million rows, and what do these columns mean? Like, like what, what does anything mean? How do you even get started, right? Um, because that is sort of like how it hits you in the first place. You're not so, uh, you don't have it all figured out as to what will give you the best accuracy when you're starting, right? You're sort of like just flitting around and hoping something sticks. The 
Yeah, the term that we learned, the feature engineering term that we learned, um, so we didn't know it was called feature engineering. It basically means you add new columns to your um, data set by figuring out what you can do with the previous columns. You do some sort of a transformation. Um, so one thing that Sean pointed out was that we, we figured out that people who are looking at a lot of cars were not actually looking to like buy um, insurance, right? They were just trying to shop, so that was some sort of a falsehood. So a lot of the features that we created were driven, uh, a whole set of features that we created were driven by the insight to pick out the non-serious customer. Like who is actually lying about wanting to buy insurance and who's here just to fiddle around. So we came up with some features like how many cars the person says they have, slash like uh, other sort of things which sort of kind of pointed that this person is definitely not serious about uh, about buying insurance, right? Like for example, some people would post some people would put in like values of cars that were alive for like 30 years, which had like ridiculous mileage that had not even been like invented yet, that were not like possible given the laws of physics and attrition. People were typing in those sort of like statistics for their cars, which were obviously false. So we created these features that captured that uh, that human element of lying just to get out uh, quotation prices. So that feature helped us a lot. Um, the feature that we sort of missed, which all the, which most other top teams got, was the birthday feature. Uh, the, if you got closer to the anniversary of a car, it's highly likely that you'll buy it. So the three key things that led people to do really well on this competition, we realized was using HD Boost more than any other model, uh, figured out some of these goal features, either one to penalize, uh, to find out who's like not serious about that, and the birthday feature, right? And I feel like if you got two out of these three, or two out of these three things, you got pretty close to the to the top ten, and the people who didn't make it sort of like just didn't get these three ideas, so it sort of came down to that. Yeah. So uh, again, like it was really insightful. Like the final challenge, again, when you put it in just juxtaposition with the preliminary challenge, it kind of shows you the limitations of deep learning. Like a lot of the other teams, they started off with deep learning, or their end goal was to build a great neural network, and uh, obviously it didn't work as well. Um, and as someone who's currently doing research in deep learning for, uh, um, I like, I feel that there's still a long way for deep learning as well, even though now it's kind of like state of the art. Uh, and yeah, so it was really insightful for us. We learned a lot. Uh, in the end, we were, uh, fortunately, we finished seventh out of uh, the 20 teams, and uh, again, we, yeah, we had a lot of fun. So, so I just want to share a bit about you know what it is, just observing other teams, um, because right across from where we said was the Russian data mafia. You have Hegelian number one there. So sometimes you know you're typing stuff and you just look across. Okay. And one thing I really observed, okay, like the moment where. <laughs> We sort of had the epiphany that they were doing something right, was it was at 2 a.m. and all of us were struggling. Um, Sean, uh, one of us told Sean, Sean, uh, take a shower, right? And then come back. And we look over to the other table, empty. The Russian data market team was basically gone to sleep. And they were actually, so the whole time they were actually looking at the screen, they were just monitoring um, their, their processes. Just making sure everything's running in the background properly and all these things. Because I think pretty much they've automated everything. So there's just one observation we had. Like this guy got it figured out they had enough sleep. We didn't have enough sleep. We we went at each other at some point in time until we decided, okay guys, so you're just gonna stick to X boost. So so that was some of the things that we learned from other teams. Um there were like um, other insights that we got um, you know from um, the mentors, actually. So they were really helpful. Kate Gemini, the people who, who, who sponsored this event, they came, every time they came, by, they came by our tables, they would ask us to think about one thing. Like, like they would really ask us to step back. Step back from a data set, look at it from a different point of view. And then that was when we really got interesting insights. That was when we figured out, oh, okay, you probably have to include this feature in this entire thing. So I think, like in the spirit of competition, like while the twenty kids were going at it, like there were like unsung heroes, which were the mentors. They were there throughout. I mean, they really guided some of our thoughts and processes. There were many times where you just had to step back, abandon your last thirty minutes or two hours of work, and just restart. 
and that's sort of it's it's sort of that that I I, I would say um, mental resilience. You just have to, uh, like you just have to get over the fact that things if it, it doesn't work, just move on and go ahead with it. So these are just the soft things that we learn from the competition, um, and I think we're gonna like, carry those things with us and carry those lessons. Um, maybe the only lesson we still have to learn is to really get proper hardware. <laughs> um, if there are hardware sponsors here, um, <laughs> you guys can come forward. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's all. Sean, Rohan, yeah, thank you so much. Any questions, just ask. you guys try the other architecture uh, of the image other than AlexNet, other than ResNet? No, I just uh, Super simple, like SK Learn stuff at the very beginning, like the first thing we tried like, was just the progression in SVN. Obviously, you know, uh, I don't think they even got like 40%, but it's just like, kind of get a, to get a baseline. Yeah, I mean, I mean other neural net architecture. I don't think other model can perform better than image software for compared to the neural net, but yeah. Yeah, so the ones that we listed were the ones we used. So ResNet, Inception V3, and, uh, and CafeNet, uh, or AlexNet, we didn't use Cafe uh, this time. Um, yeah, those were the three main three ones. Maybe we might have used Linet at some point, but I didn't think it made sense to use Linet for this. Yeah. Uh, so, regarding the, uh, the insight you had with respect to uh, people shopping for cars instead of shopping for insurance, uh, were there any other insights that you collected? Uh, specific from point of view that you would probably resell that information to a car seller <laughs> that way? I, I don't know how much you're supposed to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, yeah, I, I, I mean, it has already taken the liability, so. I, I think, like, yeah, that, that's the beauty of, you know, like, data science. Like, you really, you could, it's so like, if you have a hunch, then you could really verify it using these models. And then, yeah, maybe you could become a data consultant like that. Yeah. A bit philosophical, so feel, uh, feel free not to answer this one, but you mentioned that the Russian team was doing a lot of automation, probably running, is it the future of data science in a way? Because you are talking about the hunch and the feeling and these guys are coming with something which is probably brute force or fine-tuning the model themselves? Or yeah, uh, that's, that's a great question. I, I, I did, or we've been thinking about that for a while. And um, <laughs> like auto ML, that's an actual field. Uh, it, was, it, it came up in one of the talks at the opening ceremony where you know you don't even need data scientists. You just run it through a model and somehow figures out uh, what to predict and uh, predicts it well. Um, and, and I think, yeah, I mean, I see why not. Yeah. Really. Uh, so, so yeah, we, we asked her a question. I think that uh, when the Russians presented, they actually did a lot of like uh, uh, feature engineering based on their uh, uh, based on the knowledge like heuristics. So they actually they are the only team that that I recall that they when they presented they they uh, presented uh, that they ran through the AXA website. They actually gone through the whole process of uh, getting the code from AXA, and then they went through the whole process of getting a feel like how is it. How does it feel like to you know like get a code from a SaaS platform? So like they were the only team that did that. The the, the Russian data mafia. So like it's I think it's not fair to say that they just you know like uh, rely on like, auto and like, uh, automated everything. But I think they also put in a considerable amount of like, their own okay. heuristics. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Correct. Uh, yeah. I think what you meant to say is like they're so experienced that when you give it a category competition, they pretty much know what to do. Okay. They could try these different feature engineering techniques. They could come up with, you know, uh, covariance tables and see which, var which variables are more relevant with each other. Maybe do some off, like PCA on the spot, um, and maybe they, they probably have a whole pipeline. Uh, I mean, the guy, one of the guys on their team is number one, like ranked number one in tackle. And so um, 
I wouldn't be surprised if he has like his own libraries that would basically automate a lot of processes. But again, yeah, like Dane said, um, I think uh, they really still put in a lot of effort to pr pr like gain a heuristic, and that's perhaps something that AutoML cannot get yet. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so maybe for now you still need humans <laughs> to do this. <laughs> so it's more than pressing a button. Yeah. Okay. Okay, it's getting late, so let's thank the team for sharing that.